Headlines were made earlier this week uh, when a ransomware attack on JBS's systems uh, threatened some of the meat supply here in the U.S. and bringing up more cybersecurity concerns across crit critical infrastructure here in the U.S. And uh, as lawmakers continue to look at this issue, I want to bring in Democratic Senator John Tester from Montana, certainly focus on the issues, uh, at least as it relates, Senator, to the to the agriculture part of the equation. So I just you know, kind of want to start with with how concerned you are by the JBS news that we saw and and really what seems to be an increasingly vulnerable critical infrastructure, at least on the technical side here in the U.S. Well, I'm very concerned about it. You know, consolidation in the marketplace of uh, agriculture, whether it's cattle, grain, uh, has been a big issue for a long, long time. And what we saw with uh, the breach of JBS shows us we've got another problem. Not only is uh, the marketplace uh, uh, severely concentrated, but now bad actors can uh, can attack this pretty easily uh, and, and have. And, and JBS uh, was a prime example. And if it happened to them, it can happen to others. So the real question here is, as you've already pointed out, what are we going to do about it? And, uh, I think there's a number of things we need to do. We need to go back to the Packers and Stockyards Act passed 100 years ago and make sure that it's uh, fully enforced. And then we've got to make sure these uh, companies uh, share information with uh, with our uh, intelligence groups within the government who deal with these issues all the time. And uh, and I think that's how we're going to be able to get to it, uh, get to a solution to the problem. Uh, look. Uh, uh, the, the bottom line is this, this has happened. It's happened multiple times over the last month. It's gonna to continue to happen. When companies start using better uh, computer hygiene, I guess that's the word, It'll it, that will help a lot. But we've got to share information. And it, what these hacks have shown us is the con concentration in our food system, in our food chain is not good. It's not good for the consumers. It's not good for the country. Certainly not good for the folks in production agriculture. Well, and as you as you alluded to, Senator, it's Julie here. Certainly, it's not limited to the to the agricultural industries, right? We've seen it at utilities. I believe the MTA uh, in New York City recently um, revealed a hack, and it obviously it's not in these organizations' interest to be hacked, right? They should have better security. Um, what is their willingness, though, to cooperate with authorities if that is part of the answer? One would think they would want all the help they could get. Well, there has been hesitancy, and you might say, why would there be hesitancy? Uh, it, it's money. Uh, people are concerned maybe their stocks might drop if, if people know fully what happened. Uh, but, but the bottom line is this is bigger than money. This is about critical infrastructure for this country, whether it's in food, whether it's in energy, whether it's in water, as you pointed out. And uh, information sharing is really, really important in all this uh, so that we can find out who did it on a timely basis and hold those people accountable. I don't think individual businesses have the capacity to do that. And in fact, what we've seen is that the ransoms have been paid. And in my opinion, that's the worst possible thing that can be happening. So there's uh, there's work to be done here, a lot of work to be done here. It shows about some inherent problems we have in our food systems that we need to deal with in a common sense way. And it also shows that uh, we're very vulnerable for, to cyber attacks and we need to do better on that front too. And it's one of the reasons as the chairman of the defense appropriations that cyber is my number one priority. Senator, so much focus in our world of financial markets on inflationary being transitory or not transitory, but you, you are a working farmer. What are you seeing on your farm right now in terms of inflation? And do you think it's transitory? Uh, look, I, I, I'm seeing some concerns around inflation. Now, whether it is a bump uh, in uh, in the economy because of the pent up demand uh, of the pandemic, or whether it's something that we're going to see continue to move upward is is yet to be proven. Uh, but uh, trust me, um, uh, the ex experts I talk to say it's a bump. It's going to level off by the end of the year. We're going to be back to where we have been over the last you know 20 or so years. Uh, but the but the bottom line really is it's a concern for me right now. I will tell you that when. Uh, if housing prices are through the roof because you can't buy a pickup. Uh, I do my own uh, repair work. Uh, parts have gone up noticeably. Uh, so, so we've got some challenges out there. We've got to make sure that, that, uh, that we're, we're dealing with that in a common sense way also. Well, and Senator, you know, on that on that point, speaking of your home state, uh, you guys are getting another congressional seat next year. There's been a huge influx of out-of-staters moving into Montana, not just in the pandemic over the last couple of years. I'm just curious what you're hearing from 
your constituents on the pressures they're seeing in their home markets um, because you know I can pull up a Zillow listing for you know, Bozeman and uh, Whitefish. I mean, it is it is really crazy out there. Uh, look, you're absolutely correct, and it's really an impediment to our economy across this country. And Montana is not excluded from this. I think affordable housing, workforce housing. Uh, you know, the president put in his infrastructure bill. I think it's important we address it. If we don't address it in infrastructure, address it somewhere else because. It's not allowing our economy to be able to expand the way it needs to expand. And look, we are uh, in competition with China economically and militarily too, as far as that goes. We need to make sure that we do everything we need to do at the federal level to make sure that our economy can continue to grow if we're gonna be continue our position as a leader in the world. And housing is a big part of that. So I think we need to address it. Housing prices, you're right, whether it's Bozeman, Missoula, just about anywhere. In fact, I will say anywhere, Housing prices have gone up markedly in our state, and it's it's been a real anvil for business to be able to hire people for a place to live. It's been a problem with uh, with uh, businesses uh, moving into uh, an area to be able to expand that economy. It's a big problem. We need to deal with the federal level. There are some programs out there, tax incentives and other things that we can do to help move the, the housing program along, but it needs to be a priority for Congress. And related to the housing issue, I know you're putting forth a bill uh, to address the the medical professional shortage that has been seen in some rural areas. And you know, we were chatting in the break. I mean, you know, local in your state can be 90 minutes, two hours away. But in the pandemic, that wasn't good enough for a lot of people. What are you What are you hoping um, to kind of what bottleneck are you hoping to unlock there? You know, for your state and many others that really face a critical shortage of healthcare professionals. I'll get to the doctor residency thing in a second, but I will tell you one of the solutions is good broadband, and that's been deficient too. So good broadband for telehealth is one way. Another way is this bill that you just talked about that I'm carrying to allow small hospitals to be able to have residencies. Uh, and, and I think that what's been shown is when a doctor does a residency in an area, they tend to stay in that area. And I think if we can get these folks into more rural parts of our state, uh, they'll tend to stay there just like they do in more urban parts. And I think that is... That is good for rural America. I can tell you the small town I come from hasn't had a doc in probably 25 years. We've got physician's assistants, they do great work, but it'd be great to have a doc too. And uh, in order to do that, I think expanding the residencies is one of those keys. All right, Senator Johns Hester of Montana. Uh, Senator, really appreciate you take some time to talk with us uh, this morning. And I look forward uh, to visiting your state in a couple of months time and hopefully- uh, I look to forward to having you out the great state of Montana and bring all your friends too. It's a marvelous- That's place. right. I will. I uh, fully conflicted here. I love Montana. All right, Senator, really appreciate the time. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. Stitch Fix is out this week with much better than expected quarterly earnings as consumers began to rebuild their closets after a year of being quarantined. The company will enter post-pandemic life with a new CEO and CFO at the helm, both tasked with improving the online retailer's execution. Dan Jett is Stitch, Fix, Stitch Fix's new CFO, and he joins us now. Dan, good to uh, talk with you here. Uh, I think a lot of those folks on the street really focused in on active uh, client growth, up 20% in the most recent quarter. What's driving that and how sustainable is that? Hi, happy to be with you guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we ended the quarter with 4.1 million active customers. Uh, we added 234,000 quarter on quarter, which is our, high, our second highest quarter edition ever. And we're seeing uh, customers come, come back and we're seeing new customers arrive. They want help in, uh, in dressing. Um, we see more, uh, more, uh, more attire for going out. Uh, and, uh, and customers want that personalized, curated service that we give them at Stitch Fix. Hey, Dan, it's Julie here. Um, I noticed um, rompers and jumpsuits up 60% year over year, midi dresses up 80% year over year. Um, and we've talked about this trend a lot on the show, people getting excited about going out into the world again and buying clothes accordingly. You guys have been switching a little bit to less of a so-called surprise model for what's in the boxes and, and giving customers more choice. Talk to me about how that's working through um, and kind of what percentage that is now and what you expect that to look like going forward. Yeah, Stitch Fix was started with the idea of five items in a box, uh, highly curated. We use data science and creative judgment, and we're expanding that to a direct buy model where you can come to the site or through the app and get a highly curated and personalized experience just for you uh, through direct buy. 
Uh, so, you know, it's uh, gone are the days of the endless scrolling or walking into a dressing room with five, six pairs of jeans and, and they don't fit and walking out with nothing. We're only going to show you items that we think you're going to love and we're going to show you items that fit you. And you get that with the direct buy experience. It's growing very rapidly. It makes up a meaningful part of our business and we're very excited about it. Right now, it's available to fix only customers, but very soon we'll be opening up for everyone. Dan, you're about six months uh, into the CFO position at the company, joining Stitch Fix from Amazon. Now that you're, you've had some time here, got to meet everyone, uh, what are some of your biggest priorities in the back half of the year? Yeah, our, our biggest priority is to continue to uh, innovate on behalf of our clients in the fixed business. It's, it's, a, it's a big business for us. It's very successful. It's like 4.1 million active clients. But we're also very excited to roll out the shop experience to everyone and let everyone come in and get that highly personalized experience uh, that, our, that our current fixed customers get. So that's a big focus for us. We're going, to, we're going to open that up later this uh, later this fiscal year, the, our, our fiscal Q4, which ends in July. Uh, and we're going to start to market it in our uh, fiscal year 22, starting uh, in our Q1. So we're very excited about that. It's a big priority for us. It really does open up the addressable market for us to the entire apparel and footwear market in the U.S. and the U.K., which are the two countries that we're in. So we're very excited to, we're very excited to launch that direct buy business. Dan, have you started to explore the rental and uh, the secondhand market? Those markets are ex exploding. Why isn't Stitch Fix involved in there yet? Yeah, there are a lot of interesting uh, business models out there in fashion. Uh, you know, we're very focused on the direct buy experience and the fix business. Uh, eventually, we may look at that, uh, but our, our priorities right now are to launch that direct buy business, which again, we think is, is huge and is uh, and something that's going to expand our addressable market. So uh, again, this is something we'll, we're always looking at, always thinking about. Stitch Fix has, uh, has, has, has uh, had over $7 billion, tens of millions of fixes out there. We're in a lot of people's closets. Uh, and so that's an interesting model that we'll look at. But for now, the direct buy uh, and our fixed business are our focus. Hey, Dan, I want to ask you about um, shipping delays and sort of supply chain, because I know you talked on the call about how things are getting better at the West Coast ports. It's easier to get stuff in. Um, so what does that trajectory look like for you? Is it smooth sailing, pardon the pun, from here on out? And, and what are your input costs looking like as well? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we uh, we do, we have seen some delays at our ports, uh, but nothing material, nothing that's impacted us. We uh, we planned for this. Uh, we knew the economy and these uh, the states would would be opening up. So uh, while we've seen some delays, uh, it hasn't impacted our client experience like it has to many others. So we're very happy with that. Uh, with respect to input costs. Like, like many others, we are seeing costs increase, uh, specifically uh, with, uh, with competition in the, in the warehouse and fulfillment center workers. We, we announced uh, in our last quarter that we are increasing our wages to over $15 an hour. And we're going to continue to look at that and, and, uh, and, and be competitive. Uh, you know, our fulfillment centers are, uh, are basically the front line for the client experience. And we continue to invest in ensuring we have uh, we, we can attract and retain our fulfillment center workers um, for the best customer experience possible. And, you know, Dan, one of the other themes that we've talked a lot about is companies raising prices as a result of the increase in wages and other input costs. Is that something you guys are doing or considering also? You know, we, we're always looking at the market. Um, we're very price competitive. Uh, we look at, uh, we have multiple price points and we'll continue to look at it. But as of right now, we feel very good. Uh, we have not raised prices. Uh, we feel very good with where we're at. Dan, it's, it's Miles here. I, I want to ask just about the, the stock and the volatility you've seen. I mean, we've seen a lot of companies um, for a time. Stitch Fix was kind of caught in that first wave of the, the short squeeze meme back in the early winter. And uh, I'm just curious as a CEO, CFO, sorry, you know, of a company and you, you see that kind of volatility in your stock, do you ever think about coming to market or do you just try to keep your head down and, and not think too much about that? Particularly as more executive teams have started to lean into you know, that part, that part of their story. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting time with stock volatility in the market in general. We're less focused on short-term volatility. We're very fortunate to have long-term investors that are focused on the long-term. 
so we continue to be heads down, focus on the client experience, not focus on the short-term volatility, uh, really focused on the long-term output outcome. And again, focused on uh, generating more free cash flow over the long term. Dan, as I mentioned earlier, you came from Amazon. And I look down in Texas right now, and there's GameStop. You know, they've recruited five executives from Amazon. So my question to you is, why did you leave Amazon? And what type of experience uh, does that Amazon culture bring when you go change to another organization? Yeah, Amazon's a great company. Uh, and, and what I saw at Stitch Fix is this incredible runway ahead of it. Stitch Fix is really innovating and disrupting a space, meaning fashion, which is ripe for innovation. And when I, when I, when I actually experienced the product and I, and I actually signed up and became a fixed customer and then became a direct buy purchase, I, I, I saw how they could curate and tailor and personalize an experience in the fashion world. And that is incredibly exciting. The, the, the next 10 years at Stitch Fix are very exciting. And I think it's gonna be a really fun ride. I think it's going to be a, a big business. We have a huge addressable market in the fashion space. And uh, Stitch Fix is well positioned. We've got a 10-year head start in using data science and creative judgment. Uh, and it's a, really, uh, it's a really exciting time for the company. Dan, great to get some time with you today. Thanks for coming to see us. Dan Jetta is the CFO at Stitch Fix. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, the world's super rich just keep getting richer. A new study from Boston Consulting Group highlights more than 6,000 people entered the ultra wealthy category for the first time in 2020. That came in a year where global wealth soared, rising 8.3% to reach an all-time high of $250 trillion. Let's bring in Anna Ch Zach Chesky, Boston Consulting Group's global leader of wealth management. Anna, it's good to talk to you. I want to talk about a breakdown in the region in terms of well used, where you saw the biggest gains. Uh, but first, I am curious, when you look at just how much that number went up in 2020, how much of that was tied directly to the gains we saw in the stock market? Well, you need to look at the two drivers, right? Because the, one of the strongest drivers were actually cash and deposits. They grew by 10.6%, marking the largest annual increase in the last 20 years. And then we had equities and investment funds, which grew by 11.5%. And that part was very much driven by strong equity markets fueled by highly supportive central banks. So these were the two. And of course, cash and deposits. And I know that that's not just a stock market performance. But you know, with the world having been in lockdown, there was not that much alternatives and opportunities to spend. Well, I want to ask you about a trend we've seen over the last few years, and that's the governments around the world, U.S. and China, really cracking down on big tech and, by extension, some of their uh, big tech billionaires. And uh, we're, we got rumblings of a wealth tax by Elizabeth Warren in the Senate, probably not going to happen exactly the way she wants to propose it. What kind of clients uh, conversations are you having with your clients about these uh, these trends we're seeing here? Well, the trend that we're seeing in general, and I think on the ultra high net worth space in itself, you have the ultra high net worth segment, which in itself is the fastest growing in the world. I mean, this segment has welcomed more than 6,000 people in 2020. And the total, they hold 22 trillion of investable wealth globally. So in itself, also looking at their asset allocation and that trend, you know, I, I'm not sure if, if they are the ones that should be adding to this whole wealth tax topic in itself, as it's um, kind of also when you look at where it's distributed, primarily distributed only in 10 markets of the world globally. 10 markets of the world hold 80% of all and most of the ultra high net worth individuals holding more than 100 million US dollars each. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how we look at that. The one thing I would like to point out specifically on the ultra, since you're, since you're now talking about the, the most wealthy uh, people in the world, what we actually do see in terms of the development is that over the next years, China will actually outpace the US big time on the growth side. And China already today is generating more ultras, new wealth per year than the US over the last two years. And it will do the same by 2025. 
Uh, having said that, when you look at wealth managers dominating uh, region by region, North America certainly outpacing all of that. Um, what do you see as the big drivers there? Is it pretty much what you said at the top, uh, which is um, equities on the one hand and also central bank support? Um, what did you find on that front, region by region? I mean, if you look at the U.S., and, and that is quite remarkable, um, the U.S. has over the last 20 years more than tripled their assets to reach an all-time high of 126 trillion. And that is primarily in the US driven by the capital market. If you compare the US holds 50% of financial wealth in equities, the global average is significantly lower. It's, it's around 35%. And what we also see from a product mix and investment perspective, equities and investment funds will increase their lion's share of financial wealth, reaching close to 60% by 2025 in the US. So this is one of, the, one of the biggest drivers. And then there is another one, which is the segment lens. And since we've been talking also about the very wealthy individuals, we see that the US market is very concentrated in the hands of the richer segments. So 70% of it is held by individuals with more than 1 million US dollars. And of course, the wealthier segments also have a bigger asset allocation and are more skewed towards equities and investment funds, especially in the US. I want to ask you about the portfolio composition trends that you may have been seeing over the last year. I've heard rumblings, for instance, about uh, ultra wealthy purchasing farmland to hedge against price inflation and food and other things like that. So where are you seeing the money flows for the ultra rich? I mean, where the money is flowing and what we have seen is actually a surge and also an acceleration in real assets. And real assets is what we see as real estate, alternative investments um, such as private equity and also commodity. So we do really have seen a surge of roughly 7%. And we actually expected, especially these investment trends to continue um, and to go back roughly to pre-COVID levels around 5% over the next, next five years. So in the end, the asset allocation, of course, with the all-time high of capital markets on one hand side, also in parallel with the surge of cash and deposits, surge to wealthy individuals to also look for these alternative investment sources. So yes, there has been yeah. quite, a, quite a large growth. And what is quite interesting, though, in the US, mm -hmm. um, just to point it out, because you asked for the regional mix, we actually see that the US, compared to most of the other markets, is especially on the real assets, is relatively low. So yeah. with only 28%. In other markets, you know, the real assets, talking real estate, commodities, et cetera, tends to be 50 to 60 percent. And, and really quickly, Anna, what does this mean for inequity? If you're talking about a place like the U.S., North America as a whole, I mean, are we seeing more and more of the wealth being concentrated in a smaller pool? We actually see more and more wealth being in more hands. Because if you look back five to 10 years ago, we used to have quite a high concentration more on the ultra segment, which means, you know, 100 million plus. What we see right now that there is one very, very large pool in the US, and it's actually a highly attractive one, is what we call the pool of the lower high networks, which have, you know, one to three million US dollars, one to five million US dollars, so the surging middle class. And if you look at that, that's why we say there is more wealth in more hands. Um, this pool is, is very much growing. Globally, we're talking about 330 million people um, in, in that space. And especially, mm -hmm. this is a large opportunity in the US for wealth managers, because roughly you know, 90 to 100 million of these individuals are in that bracket. And this is a surging middle class. So the concentration in itself is actually becoming less. Uh, good to get some of those numbers there. Anna Dekjewski, a Boston Consulting Group's global leader of wealth management. Good to talk to you tonight. Well, Democratic and Republican lawmakers are scrambling to draft a bipartisan infrastructure bill after talks between the White House and Republicans collapsed 
earlier this week. The big sticking point, though, still how to pay for the infrastructure investments. Let's bring in Republican Congressman Peter Meyer from Michigan. We've also got Yahoo Finance's Jessica Smith joining in on the conversation. And Congressman, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, you're a member of the so-called Problem Solvers Caucus. You've put forward this plan of about $761 billion in new spending. Um, how much support do you have for that outside of this bipartisan group? You know, what we put forward, which is an eight-year framework, um, is just that. It's it's a framework. We, we've we tried to focus on key items that are traditionally known as infrastructure, um, not adding in or trying to expand the categories into human infrastructure, but to say we have real tangible things we need to be doing. We need to be focusing on long-term investments in our roads, our bridges, our tunnels. We need to be focusing on getting rural broadband and bring, bridging the digital divide in this nation. Um, so this eight-year $1.249 trillion. And to your point, there was uh, around $700 billion, uh, depending on the estimates, anywhere from $550 to, to $750 billion in new spending over that eight-year time frame. Um, our framework was focusing on where the priority spending should be. And the next stage of those talks will be focused on how we pay for it. Hi, Congressman Jessica Smith here. We are starting to hear from some progressive lawmakers who are saying, if climate measures are not included in this bill, then no deal. What kind of climate provisions do you think should be in an infrastructure package? Uh, so in our package, uh, there's still some funding for electric vehicle infrastructure, including and with a strong focus on transit infrastructure. Um, I, I drive an electric vehicle. I still found, I think it was the $400 billion that the Biden administration had thrown out for electric charging infrastructure to be um, hard to justify, especially given the pace of, of market rate charging infrastructure that's already being developed. Uh, so, you know, there's certainly that component, but oftentimes when we start talking about, we need this to be focused solely on climate change, um, the, that is not often pegged to realistic metrics. It's more an excuse to wrap in unrelated priorities, uh, but just to put it under the broad brush infrastructure because, you know, everyone wants to build, right? I guess, how do you make that distinction when infrastructure, transportation is so intertwined with climate? How do you draw the line of what is core infrastructure and what's not? I mean, to me, the, what draws the line is what supports and underpins our economy and our functioning as the country. I mean, to your point, you can make the extrapolation that a highway has cars driving on it and the cars driving on it if may or may not be emitting carbon depending on their uh, you know, propulsion mechanism. Um, but to say that we need to be thinking about climate change and whether or not to repave a highway, I think a little bit misses the forest for the trees. And so, I mean, to an extent, you can link everything together if you're creative enough with your rhetoric. Um, but if we also don't ground this and realize that, I mean, these are literally concrete measures. I mean, we will be pouring concrete as part of this infrastructure plan um, that we should be focused on what that is and not trying to, you know, just stretch these, defin these definitions past anything a dictionary might find even remotely plausible. I want to ask you about this climate climate movement that you're part of, a growing movement within the conservative wing of the party. Now, you say conservative, typically climate change awareness uh, doesn't really top the register there. What's that like for you? And what's that building process, that consensus building process like? Yeah, yeah. please don't confuse my desire to make sure that infrastructure talks infrastructure and that environmental and climate proposals talk environmental and climate. Um, you know, I'm, I, I do not con like these conflations. I do not like uh, omnibus efforts that try to wrap everything together um, and, and make it harder to focus on, on how they're actually going to be impactful. But to your point, I mean, I believe that climate change is a real and pressing threat to this country. Um, I think that we should be taking a, not only a conservation mindset, but also realizing that how we get to where our goal is, is just as important as what that goal is. Uh, if we look at a lot of the economies that are able to get their carbon emissions down, that are able to have a strong coexistence with their environment, uh, it's not countries that focus overly on social planning. It's ones that still have a vibrant economy. So we need to realize what that wellspring, what that engine is. And I strongly resist the efforts to conflate climate change and protection of the environment with wrapping in unrelated social policies. And to me, the Green New Deal was an effort to take an issue that a lot of folks agree on, which is environmental protection and the climate, uh, to take that and use it as an excuse for a fundamental transformation of the American economy. Um, and uh, towards a top-down centrally planned system rather than one that will be bottom-up focused on outcomes and overall giving us the prosperity we need to take care of the planet that we depend on. 
Uh, following up on the point that Jessica made, though, about where, in fact, that line is, what environmental issues, what climate issues should fall under the infrastructure umbrella? Uh, what about something like building out the renewable energy grid? I mean, you mentioned that all of this should underpin the economy, and yet some would argue, well, if you're addressing climate, well, shouldn't it be about curbing greenhouse gas emissions, which ultimately means you have to build out the energy grid in a cleaner way? And absolutely, there is a strong emphasis on, um, and, and I actually would prefer to relitigate the current war of, of the prior century um, and focusing on if we're going to be looking at um, where our renewable energy resources are, whether that's hydro, wind, uh, solar, how we get those resources, which oftentimes are in less populated areas, how we get that energy generated efficiently to the areas where the consumption is highest. I also think there's a strong benefit from an overall resiliency standpoint, and that can be because of foreign intrusion and, and, and grid protection or because of natural disasters, to having more distributed generation rather than massive you know, centralized generation. So that's gonna require some retooling of the grid to account for greater solar and wind production. I think there are also fantastic opportunities to take advantage of the greater expansion of electric vehicles to provide more backup and resiliency to the grid, but we need to be thinking about that in a smart long-term way. So in the plan that the Problem Solvers Caucus put forward, it also had a significant tranche a lot allocated for you know, grid uh, resiliency. Uh, and that has a twofold approach. That's making sure what we have right now is reliable and protected, but also that it's going to be well suited to adapt to changing patterns of both energy consumption and energy generation. Congressman, I wanted to ask just a more broad question. In your first term in Congress here, you have bucked your party on a few occasions, most notably during the impeachment vote. What do you think are other areas where lawmakers might be able to reach across the aisle, might be able to find some bipartisan compromise going forward? Well, I, I saw the segment before was talking about the JBS ransomware attack. And, and just yesterday in Homeland Security, we were talking with the CEO of the Colonial Pipeline about that incident. Um, I think making sure that our country is fortified against these threats from hostile foreign actors, uh, whether they are state sponsored, whether they are criminal organizations operating with some vague notion of state protection or whether they are um, you know, state actors themselves. We need to be making sure we're doing everything we can to protect not only our electrical grid, as I mentioned, but just our infrastructure from a critical standpoint, and that includes pipelines, uh, but also our economy and our business environment in general. Um, I think we'll have strong bipartisan agreement there on the cybersecurity front. We've already seen strong bipartisan agreement in a number of foreign policy areas uh, and also just dealing with how to protect and defend and strengthen this country. Um, the, the, where it's really going to get and the rubber will hit the, uh, the roads we hope to build uh, is how to pay for the infrastructure plan. Um, and, and so that's what we're currently speaking to right now. Um, so we may have some disagreements there, but I think overall there are areas where we can find bipartisan agreement um, but it has to actually be bipartisan. And all too often with the Biden administration, it's been a, um, what I would call revolutionary, but that they would phrase as transformational um, plans being put forward uh, that are not open to compromise, that are not open to, you know, traditional legislative systems. Um, and as a result, um, it's really been, you know, a, a pretty hollow effort at achieving some type of bipartisan objective. Yeah, actual bipartisanship. I'm holding my breath for that. Representative Pierre Maher, thank you for joining us here. But we do have a lot to get to, at least when it comes to the economic recovery, as well as the president's first international trip. So I just want to jump straight into it now. We've got Ian Bremer, president of the Eurasia Group and G Zero Media here with us now. Uh, so, Ian, I want to start with some of the, the economic data that we had gotten out today. Uh, the CPI jumping 5 percent in May, faster than had been expected. Curious to know what kind of path you see being charted here right now, at least when it comes to the economic recovery. Not just here at home in the United States, but also globally, as we keep hearing these inflation numbers as signs that the economy right now could be on the verge of overheating. Well, number one, you know I'm not an economist, so uh, I'm not going to pretend to be one on television, but I, I, it is very clear that this is a very differentiated recovery um, in the United States. Uh, we are largely at this point looking at coronavirus pandemic in the rearview mirror. Finally, um, while in the developing world, we are not close to that. And as inflation fears grow, the countries that we're going to be most worried about are those that aren't going to be able to secure credit, those whose debt has been uh, extending 
uh, greatly. We're seeing this across Latin America right now. Uh, we're seeing concerns in places like Lebanon and in Turkey, uh, markets like Sri Lanka and the Philippines that potentially could be experiencing financial crises as a consequence of this in the next six, 12 months. That's what I'd be most worried about as the second order effects of the U.S. economy, you know, so-called overheating with a very robust um, with a very robust rebound. Ian, uh, Julie noted that you're not an economist, but would love to get your thoughts on, on how the Federal Reserve might react to these reports. I mean, look, the CPI is one piece of data, but undoubtedly inflation is heating up. We're waiting for the Fed to pull the trigger and pull back on all that stimulus and also start to raise interest rates. Do you think that our economy can withstand uh, less candy from the Federal Reserve candy jar right now? Uh, every month that goes by, uh, certainly the need for monetary stimulus seems a lot lower. Uh, I think the real question is not about the stock market. It's not about U.S. growth. It's about the average American. We hear that from Biden uh, in Europe right now, that you need a foreign policy that actually works for the average American. You need an economic policy that works for the average American. And uh, it is, you know, I, I am much more concerned about the fate of the four trillion, three trillion, increasingly maybe two trillion um, in longer term, broadly defined infrastructure support that would help to address a country, the world's wealthiest, the world's most powerful, but also the most unequal of the entire G7. That's here in the United States. And that inequality is only growing on the back of coronavirus. You have a college degree. You did very well through the last 15 months. You don't. You really didn't. Um, and it's great that we put enough money in the pockets of those that were disrupted, uh, that they uh, were able to get through the last 15 months. But that's short term. Uh, that's not what the next five, 10 years are going to look like. That, that is the concern that I have when I look at the future of the U.S. economy. So to that point, how should the United States best navigate that? This, you know, tale of two cities that we've frequently been talking about throughout this entire pandemic and what you're highlighting right now that, you know, some folks did incredibly well. In fact, they're better off now uh, a year into the pandemic than they were when we started it. And considering how poorly the economy did, that's that's pretty incredible. But as you mentioned, we still have so many people that are financially struggling, that lost their jobs, have not been able to find a job or, or had to leave their jobs and have no plans on returning back to the labor market. So policy wise, really, what does the United States need to do to continue to walk that line uh, between not adding too much to our national debt, but also helping those that are still right now being left behind? Uh, well, I, I have no problem adding to our national debt if we're investing in things that will bring us a return. Uh, so for example, I like the idea of major infrastructure investment into rural broadband that will allow the average underserved American to participate more effectively in the economy, in digital learning and what have you for themselves and for their kids. I think that's a great idea. I like the idea of robust pre-K child support um, so that the average American can both take care of their kids and work effectively, be in employment, especially because we don't have, you know, sort of a uh, a well-functioning two ki two parents, uh, two kids in every household in the United States. Those are expenditures that I think would make a difference, would lead to a return for the United States long term. By the way, I like the fact that we have two hundred and fifty billion dollars heading through Congress right now that is bipartisan both Democratic and Republican, it is being framed in terms of beating the Chinese. But the reality is it's investing in American science and research and development in semiconductors and in artificial intelligence, things that we truly want the United States to be investing in. They would bring a return over the long term. The fact that the U.S. government investors invests a considerably lower percentage of GDP into research and development than China does is something we should frankly address. I don't think that's sustainable long term if we want to maintain our position in the world. Ian, what about the Biden administration's response to the string of ransomware attacks that we've been seeing uh, in a number of different sectors here in the U.S.? Uh, it looks like the Biden administration is trying to come up with a task force to address this. What do you think needs to be done there? What would you like to see happen? 
so far, there's been virtually nothing that's been done until last week uh, when we saw the FBI uh, be able to uh, announce a success by tracking uh, the uh, the Bitcoin wallet and and securing it uh, away from um, the, uh, the 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 hackers for the Colonial Pipeline, the four million dollars. And if we can do that with them, who's to say we can't do it with others? So the potential to be able to disrupt some of these cyber criminals uh, through American unilateral action on the part of the feds. That would be, it's certainly a great individual data point. Let's see if it's extensible. Um, having said that, Biden is going to be meeting next week in Geneva with President Putin. Putin has not personally been ordering any of these ransomware attacks, but he is fully aware that there are criminal syndicates that are permitted in his country that act with reckless abandon on corporations all over the world, except in Russia and the former Soviet states. And the United States is gonna to have to make it clear that the Russians are going to pay a cost if they allow that to persist. Thus far, under Obama, under Trump, and under Biden, that has not yet been the case. I will say that I'm a little bit less concerned about ransomware than others because I feel like it is a, a market equilibrium seeking practice. If you are a cyber criminal, you don't wanna make ransom too expensive and you don't want to be bringing down corporations for a long period of time. You want it to be something you know they're gonna pay and it's gonna be very easy to get back up and running because you want the next corporation to trust you that if they pay that ransom, that they can do it and they can get on with their business. If suddenly you have a whole bunch of companies saying, that was too much, I don't know if this is gonna work, I don't, this is gonna blow up my firm. What if the data ends up not being uh, private as they promised, but that leaks anyway? Well, then suddenly the entire business model of these criminals goes poof and, and they don't wanna do that. So the danger is not that you have so much a couple of really effective, almost corporations in the criminal space in Russia. The danger is what happens when this technology suddenly becomes accessible to people that don't have that level of sophistication or that have ideologies that aren't about maximizing profit. What if it was an eco-terrorist that was doing it? Then Colonial Pipeline isn't paying ransomware. Then they're just shut down. And that's the end of Colonial Pipeline. That's what I worry about. We are back with Ian Bremmer, president of Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. So, uh, Ian, I want to bounce off something we were talking about just ahead of the of the break, and that is uh, President Biden's first foreign trip as commander in chief. I think the highlight's going to be when he comes face to face with Russian P President Vladimir Putin. It really is a test, uh, a major diplomatic test for the Biden administration. What do you think the tone of that meeting is going to be, and what are your expectations for it? Well, uh, the working level meetings between the Biden administration, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, and Foreign Minister Lavrov in Reykjavik were dramatically better, more civil, uh, more engaged in substance than the same meetings that occurred between the U.S. and China in Anchorage. So if that is any indication, and it should be taken as one because this is how you prep for your, your first face-to-face -face summit, it's that I don't expect all that much. Uh, I think that this is Biden's intention to get the measure of the man in terms of Vladimir Putin in person, head of state to head of state. Um, and I also uh, think that the most important word that Biden has used consistently in talking about Russia is they want a more predictable relationship. Not that the Americans are happy with the status quo, but they don't want surprises. They don't want to fight, especially because they consider China accurately, in my view, to be by far the more important, the more strategic competitor and challenger for U.S. national security and foreign policy going forward. So I, I think that this meeting is not going to be really dramatic, even though the media you know, is expecting that it's going to make a lot of headlines. I think there will be an effort to clear the air in areas that the Americans are particularly unhappy with Russia and cyber, as we've noted, is number one right there. Uh, but I also think that Biden will look for areas to cooperate uh, on uh, nuclear and arms agreements, for example, as well as on climate. And I, I think that if anything surprises us from the Putin meeting, I think it might be that it's a slightly warmer, a slightly more engaged meeting than people are expecting right now. 
So, Ian, the, the president isn't just necessarily meeting with America's adversaries, I'll, I'll call them, but also some of our friends. And he's kicking off this meeting in the United Kingdom. Curious to know, especially given the shift between the last administration and the one that we currently have, what kind of work needs to be done with our allies? And what are the priorities do you think the administration is going to have moving forward with countries like the United Kingdom, for example? Uh, he... The Biden administration clearly wants to show uh, that the transatlantic relationship is functional and that multilateralism isn't dead, that democracy isn't dead, that we want to work with democracies because the democratic model is not looking at its best right now. We, we saw that on January 6th in a horrible way in our own country, and also because China's authoritarian model is consolidated, robust, and not going anywhere. And it's certainly not adapting towards the United States. Um, so I think that Biden wants to show the relationship between the U.S. and allies in terms of democracies is real, is robust, and has a future. And that America is willing to do some leadership. Not far by far, coming out is this announcement of 500 million U.S. vaccines that will be distributed to countries all over the world. And there will be an announcement participating in that as well. Uh, there'll also be tens of billions of dollars in financing to support that. That'll be the most important headline coming out of the G7. But you've also seen in terms of movement on tax policy, some level of coordination. We'll see some of that on climate too. It's not as if um, the transatlantic relationship is returning to the status quo ante. That's not true. And specifically on China, Biden's top priority Europeans don't see eye to eye with the United States, but there is more than not out of All right, Ian, uh, Ian, unfortunately, we're starting to... Nope, go ahead, Alexis. Yeah, let's try. I know your, your audio is kind of going in and out, but Ian, I'm going to try another one with you here. President sure. Biden this week revoked those Trump-era bans or, or attempts to ban those Chinese-owned apps, uh, WeChat and TikTok. Um, what's your, what is your feeling? I mean, it's still early on in his presidency, but do you believe that Biden is going to go softer on China? Do we know enough yet to make a determination? No, I think it's, they're going to be softer on Russia on balance um, because, uh, again, they want to normalize and more, make that relation more predictable. I think that on China, they're actually going to go harder. Um, I, I think that, and, and harder in part because they want to coordinate with allies where Trump largely went it alone. And that is much more deeply problematic for the Chinese government. I mean, the U.S. is looking into investigations into the origins of COVID, and they're getting the Europeans to join in that investigation. Trump would have liked to do the invest, done the investigation, but only by himself. It is true, as you mentioned, that they've just rescinded that order on TikTok. Uh, but they've replaced it with an order that's going to be broader and more systematic. Um, I don't think the Chinese see the Biden administration as patsies on any of this stuff, not to mention the fact that the Biden team focuses much more on human rights uh, issues like the Uyghurs than President Trump individually ever did. Uh, look, there is a general alignment between Democrats and Republicans on China, and you see that. Um, with the legislation that's going through Senate right now, oriented towards China. But the Biden administration is more systematic and considered in the way they orient that policy and more multilateral. So overall, I would suggest that this is an administration that's going to be harder line on China. And you saw that play out in Anchorage a few weeks ago. You're likely going to see that play out in the first proper summit meeting that Biden and Xi Jinping eventually have whenever that is. Uh, Ian, real quick, I've got about 30 seconds, but reporters have been talking to uh, former President Trump about running again in 24. He's not denying it. He's even considering perhaps having Governor DeSantis of Florida be his running mate. Uh, is it too early to count out Trump in 2024? It's too early to talk about 2024. God <laughs> love us. But um, I, I certainly think that the momentum in the Republican Party is overwhelmingly towards those that are aligned with Trumpian populism. It's DeSantis, it's Cotton, um, it's, it's you know, Hawley, it's Pompeo, that's the group. And so one way or the other, you're getting something that feels Trump-ish. Trump-ish, all right, we're gonna leave it there to be continued for sure. Ian Bremmer, great to see you as always.